recording. Okay, I've added a couple of homeworks. They're not visible to you. They're visible to me right now. I'll make them visible by the end of the day. And the first one is, will be due Wednesday. The second one is due Monday. Um, the second one though, what I'm gonna do is make it visible. Um, it, it's the closest thing to a, um, a timed event that we get. I'll make it visible Sunday, you have 24 hours to do it. And there's a, uh, three of those, I think, throughout the semester that'll work that way. But most of these other ones, you'll have uh, several days to a week to, to complete. Okay, so we're in this module, the languages and grammar section. I technically have four lectures for this. Uh, well, we had five, but the first one got shifted. So technically four. I think we'll need one and a half. Um, and then from there, it will be about working examples, answering questions. So expect a lecture today, expect a lecture Monday, and then on next Wednesday and Friday, uh, I'll use that more as a, a Q&A or office hours, you know, that kind of time. Unless I talk really slow. Okay, questions about schedule, logistics, what to expect, anything like that? Okay, outcomes. Go back after you've heard these lectures, after you've read through your material, convince yourself you know what we're talking about here. We've done this on the, I'm losing my brain guys. I didn't go over this material yet. Is that true? That's true. No, you haven't. Okay, good. <laughs> You know, time has no meaning anymore, right? All right, I've looked at these uh, slides so much, I don't know if I've talked them through or just, you know, made, them, uh, made sure I had them complete. Okay, so we've talked about this. A symbol, a distinct marker, marker character. Symbols have no meaning, no inherent meaning. The number one, right, this, this symbol right here, the numeral one, we call it the numeral one. It's a symbol. We give it the meaning that it is unity, one. Uh, we give zero the meaning that it is the lack of unity or one. But that doesn't mean it has that meaning. It means that we gave it that meaning. And so we have got to turn my mail off. There we go. So we have the... Um, Ability to supply meanings to things. They have no inherent meaning. Okay. Um, we've discussed this on the um, discussion page in Canvas. I was pleased with that discussion. I hope you guys contribute to these as we go along and um, you know, prevent your prevent your discussions and respectful arguments. Okay, then an alphabet is a finite set of symbols. Finite, some things we're gonna find are finite and some things aren't. Uh, so uh, alphabets are finite. And we use capital sigma for that. If you recently took CS222, hopefully you're having some flashbacks here. Because um, if, if, you, if you took CS22 in a semester where finite state machines were covered, which is most of them, then you, this is a review for you. We borrow from set notation. Um, there are a couple ways to view the foundation of everything, and set notation is one of those ways. Uh, so the um, sigma is the name of the set. It is a set, and we use the vertical lines or the vertical bars to represent size of. So if sigma is ABC, then the size of sigma is three. Almost always, we're gonna have um, size of sigma is either two or three in this course. You rarely need a system, uh, at least when you're talking about the theoretical aspects, you rarely need a system 
larger than that, you technically only need two. And um, you uh, sometimes introduce three when you need to make a special point. By the way, I'm claiming you only need two symbols in an alphabet. And if you have those two symbols, you can represent anything. Can anyone have a good argument for that statement? Is that kind of like if you have zero and one, like for the binary? Yes, it's exactly, exactly like that. So even though the, your computer technically only has an alphabet of two, which we call zero and one, an alphabet of size two, you can use combinations of those to represent all the symbols of the alphabet, all the, uh, all the Unicode symbols. I don't know how many thousands of those there are. So if you have two, you can make sequences of those that represent other things. So we'll use capital sigma for alphabet. Once we know what a uh, symbol is and an alphabet is, now we can talk about strings. And a string is nothing more than a sequence of symbols. We tend to use U, V, and W. That's convention, not, not a law. It's a convention. We let lambda represent the empty string. That's a string of length zero, has no symbols. And similarly, stealing from set notation again, even though sequences are not sets, we can steal from set notation again. The vertical bars are gonna tell you the, the, the size of the string or the length of the string. And it's, that's how many symbols it has. So if u is equal to a, b, b, c, a, then the length of u is five. The length of lambda, lambda is zero. And we can represent all possible strings as shorthand form, you with sigma with the asterisk next to it, which is called sigma star, by the way. And by the end of this set of notes, we'll know why it's called sigma star. You may know already, if you, again, if you remember from CS222. Okay, so a symbol is a single distinct mark, and set of symbols, a string is a sequence of symbols, and a language is a set of strings. That's it. A language is a set of strings. Just like the symbols have no inherent meaning, the language itself has no inherent meaning. Now if you want to use something, you can imply meaning to it or you can imply usage to it. So we infer or, or um, paste meanings onto words the word inherently doesn't hold that meaning. In fact, the meanings of words change over time based on usage. So languages have no inherent meaning. They can be used for communication. They can be used for command and control of uh, computers. They can be used for programming. That's a good distinction to have. It's nice to remember that from time to time. It can uh, clarify your thought. Okay, so that's a language. <clears throat> this uh, module is about languages and grammars. How would you distinguish a language from a grammar? Any thoughts? Grammar would be more like the rules that define the syntax of the language. Right, so grammar are the rules. And what I could do, if I say that a language is a set of strings, and then I give you a rule, like, okay, your strings have to be composed of A and B, and all the A's have to appear in triplets, A, A, A. That's a rule, but that rule will put restrictions on sigma star, the set of all possible strings. That rule will put restrictions on what strings are in the language and what are not in the language. So we can define the language by the grammar rule. And syntax is the right word, because syntax literally means allowable or legal sequences that show up within a string. So the grammar is the rules. Now, when I say that, I'm assuming that there's some kind of a pattern or a structure by which you can create a rule. Um, you know, you, could, you can think of really weird languages. You can think of random, okay, this language is just a set of random strings. I rolled, I rolled some, uh, some symbol dice and whatever came up was a string and I included that in my grammar, you really couldn't get a good rule for that by which you could create or duplicate those strings. But again, most of the languages that are useful 
uh, will have some kind of structure to them. And you know this because you've all got, you know, typo compilation errors when you tried to compile a program or some kind of weird execution error. <clears throat> the most common form, or really universally within com computer science, is the bacchus nauer form. And um, again, this goes to show that if you're the first to do something and you put your name on it, then you can become famous, right? So bacchus nauer is the name of the form of grammars we'll use in this course. Uh, we'll also use something called extended bacchus nauer which is basically a simplification. If you use a pure bacchus nauer uh, for, for things more complicated than toy languages, then you can get overwhelmed with um, the complexity of it. By complexity, I mean just the number of rules that you have to have. And so in order to cut that down, uh, we use extended bacchus nauer form. <clears throat> the bacchus nauer form is simple. Basically what it does, it's these rules are called production rules and you will produce strings that are in the language. Uh, the correct grammar would be able to produce all strings in a language and would be able to, and would never produce a string not in the language. You get the all and only rule. A good grammar, the correct grammar will produce all and only strings that are in the language. It's composed of two parts, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. I guess three parts. There's a left-hand side and then some kind of an operator and then the right-hand side. I use the arrow operator. So my rules look like this. I do that because that's what my teacher taught me, but uh, I think it's actually in the minority here. I think it's one of the few times I'm in the minority. Other systems will use this and most systems, I think, uh, actually use this form. I don't care what you use, doesn't matter. I like the arrow because it implies this transition. It's a production rule and the rules, the way you use these rules are you say, okay, if I'm making a string and on, I, inside of my string, I have a pattern that matches the left-hand side, then I can just replace it with the right-hand side. It's pretty simple. It's one of these, again, um, you're waiting for your food at Cracker Barrel and they give you a game to play on the menu kind of complexity. Okay, so if I had a production rule that said capital A can be replaced with lowercase a, capital C, lowercase a, and my current string happens to have that, well, it's got a capital A in it. So that means I can replace that capital A with lowercase a, capital C, lowercase a, and that would be my resulting string. Now, if I had another rule that said, if you have a C, you can replace it with something else, I can do another substitution and another substitution. You keep doing these substitutions over and over again until you get the string that you're interested in. So here's a simple example. <clears throat> the terms that we're gonna use, we have terminals, Terminals are the symbols in the alphabet. They're called terminals. It's a misnomer, okay? It's a misnomer. They're called terminals because in most of the grammars that you have, you, once you get a terminal, you're done. You will never find a rule where you can replace a terminal with something else. It's terminal, you're done. It's like, you know, the end of the line, right? That's what a terminal means at the, at the bus station. Uh, that's normally how it's used. And, and we're gonna find in our class, uh, you know, like 90% of the time, 95% of the time, that's gonna be true. Because grammars have been defined to cover all possible situations, we'll find situations where um, terminals aren't technically terminals. I don't know what you would call them then if you don't have a if you don't have a terminal. In other words, I could have a symbol in the alphabet, and I could have a rule where I'm allowed to replace that symbol in the of the alphabet with something else. Once you're done with the string, though, uh, all of the strings that you eventually create, eventually they do have to end up with only symbols in the alphabet. Non-terminals are intermediary symbols that are used in the grammar. So you can't necessarily jump from nothing to a full-blown string in one step. You have to take multiple steps. 
And so we use non-terminals to get us there. Convention is uppercase for non-terminals, lowercase for terminals, or you know, sometimes you can use uh, zero and one for your terminals, and then again, uppercase letters for your non-terminals. There's a special non-terminal that indicates the first rule that has to be used. It's called the start symbol. This course will use S for the start symbol. That seems like a good mnemonic. And basically, you know, think of when you run a program. Where does your program start running? It starts in main, right? And, okay, this is, think of it like main. It's where you start. So when I say, oh, okay, you have a string that has a certain pattern in it, you know, like I did here. I said, okay, you've got a string that has A, B, A, C, A in it. How did you get that string? It had to start from somewhere, right? All strings start with capital S. So when you're beginning, you have capital S and nothing else. And I made up a nonsense grammar here. If I have capital S, I can replace that with capital A, capital B. If I have a capital A, I can replace it with lowercase a, capital A, or just lowercase a. If I have a capital B, I can replace it with lowercase b, capital B, or just lowercase b. So we have five rules in this grammar. And this is the language that produces strings of composed of A's and B's where all the A's occur before any of the B's and has at least one A and at least one B. In other words, the empty string is not in this, uh, is not in this language. Now, I gave you the grammar here, and then I said, okay, describe the language, and then the, the, the description is, oh, okay, all strings having at least one A and one B, where all A's come before all B's. Is there any different amount of information in the grammar and the description of the language? Is there different, do you learn anything more than you knew uh, from one from the other? Or is there equivalence in the amount of information that's contained there. That's a good question, you're pausing. Or shy. Or I'm going to wager your guess and say it's equivalent. It's equivalent, yes, who was that? That was Caleb Lee, Dr. Garfield. Okay, hi Caleb. Hi. Okay, yes, it's equivalent. These are two forms of expressing the exact same amount of information. One form, the grammar, is more useful in a formal system because of these rules. And by useful in a formal sy system, I mean computers. I can't give a description of a language in English and then, uh, you know, here's, here's my description of Java in English and then I try to compile a Java code. That won't work. But if I have these grammar rules, it works. In fact, that's literally how it's done. The compiler has a BNF grammar for you, the language that you're programming in. Literally how it's done. Okay. Once we have the grammar, we can create strings that are in the language. And that's typically called a derivation. So the grammar is the same as the one on the previous page. All strings that have at least one A and one B and begin with A and all the A's are before the B's. So that means this string, and again, U, V, and W are what we tend to use for strings. This string U is in the language. Does it meet the rule that I described in the English version of the language? All, at least one A, at least one B, all the A's come before any of B? Yes. So we should be able to derive that string. And it's simple. I mean, I'm designing these to be simple, right? Once you get these on the simple ideas, then understanding what is happening in the compiler and understanding uh, what the meaning is for the, for the languages is, is, is not that complicated. And mercifully, if you're doing a complicated compiler, you don't do it by hand, we have software to do that for us. Okay, so how do I how do I do this derivation? Basically, all I do is I tell you what rule I'm going to use. I start with the start string. Why do I start with the start string? 
because its name is the start string? As the, yeah, exactly. That's the rule. The rule is just like you start your program in main, the rule is you start with the start symbol. So your, your string initially is just the start symbol. I'm going to use rule one, which is the only rule I have for the start symbol, and, and I produce a, b. And then I use rule four, and then I use rule four again, and then I use rule five, and then I use rule three, and each one of those just replaces a, 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 a section, a non-term, in this case, replaces a non-terminal in the string with something else. I've shown you two different derivations for a, b, b, b. And that's because we can take the rules in a different sequence. That's normal. That's, that's called normal. Yes, it's legal. We do not have a requirement that we can only produce strings with one derivation. Uh, similarly with A, A, B, B here, same idea. Where do I start? I start with the start symbol. Initially, my string only contains the start symbol. I only have one rule for that. I go to AB. And then I pick the rules in a, in a sequence that I happen to choose. I mean, I just went from left to right on the string. Did you have to? No. You have options there. So yeah. is it like no matter, you could start with A, and as long as you end up with A, B, 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 you still have done it correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as I ring, as long as I get that string, right? Okay. Yep. And and follow the rules, right? I can't make up new rules, and I can't do miracles and magic, right? I have to follow them okay. in some sequence, and 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 there are there are typically multiple sequences, probably four different sequences here, right? Or we have, let's see, we can do we can do the first A, the second A, the first B, the second B. First A, first B, sec, second A, second B, right? That, you play that kind of game, right? It's, I see. It, it, it's, it's a combinatorics game. As long as you end up with A, A, B, B. Now, let me ask a different question. This grammar that I made is what creates the language. Uh, strings that are composed of at least one A and one B, where all the A's occur before any of the B's, do you think it's the only grammar that we could have created for that language? Or could we create a different grammar for the same language? You could have more than one grammar. More than one. Do we have an upper bound on the number of grammars, do you think? I think there's potentially infinite. It might be a little redundant at some point, though. I think it is absolutely, it, I wouldn't say redundant, uh, because if it's redundant, it's the same, and, it, and then mm. you're repeating, but, but you're absolutely right. Was this Miles, or was this someone else? Oh, that's Miles. Hi, also. I can't, my, my Zoom <laughs> tell me who's talking here. Okay. So yes, it is absolutely a, an infinite number of grammars. Obviously, the, the vast majority of those are, are, are uh, bloated grammars, right? You would put in nonsense rules just to um, just to have the proof that you can go to a, a an infinite number of grammars, there's probably only you know three or four. I don't know. We could figure we, we could do it by brute force. Three or four that would be useful that actually have a small number of rules and, and get the job done. Um, Let's do another example here. <clears throat> Write a grammar for this language L1 composed of strings ending in, zoom is in my way, uh, all strings that just end in BB. So uh, again, we're gonna use uh, the alphabet of AB, all strings that end in BB. That means the smallest string, always start thinking about, okay, what's the smallest string? Is, is lambda the empty string? Is it in the language or not? Is it in the set? And in this case, no because the string has to end in BB. So the very shortest string is BB. And then after that, we can have any combination of A's and B's as long as it ends in BB. Now I've given you under practice problems, a whole bunch of languages. 
So, you know, my recommendation is, you know, practice this, get used to this, go through, go through the actual process of creation, not just following along, because it's going to light up different parts of your brain to do the creation versus the understanding of what someone else has created. Okay, so here's a simple grammar for that. Now notice I only have one non-terminal in the whole thing, which is A. And basically I say, okay, A, S goes to A, A goes to um, lowercase a, capital A, or A goes to lowercase b, capital A. And that, that, that's a typical trick, by the way. I wanna get a bunch of A's and B's and I don't care what sequence they're in. Look at rules two and three. That's how you do that. If you need to get a whole bunch of A's in a row, that's rule two does that. If you need to get a whole bunch of B's in a row, rule three does that. If you need to get A's and B's and you don't care how they're mixed up, then rule two and three work together to do that. Because what you're doing is saying, look, I have an A in my string. I can choose at any point in time to use rule A or rule, uh, I'm sorry, rule two or rule three, meaning I choose at any point in time whether I want to stick an A or a B in the string. Oh, and then the last rule just cuts it off. Okay, we're done, BB. And then I have the derivations for BB off to the side. BB being the shortest string is a nice short derivation. And the longer derivation is you pick a rule, you pick a rule. Okay, I need an uh, A, B, A, B, B, B. Okay, I need an A, so I'm gonna use, uh, first of all, I go from S to A using rule one. I don't have any choices. I am going to, um, need, I need an A, so I use rule two. I need a B, so I use rule three. I need an A, so I use rule two, rule two on and on and on. And finally, once I'm at the point where I just need to tack on those last two BBs, I use rule four. Is that the only derivation or can we come up with other derivations for that string? Let me ask for string one. For the short string BB, is there another derivation based on that grammar? No. No. How about this? Do you think there's another derivation based on the grammar that's given? Is that a yes? <laughs> it's, hard to, it's harder to see, isn't it? Yes, yeah, very much. Is there another one? I don't see it. There's not another yeah, one. See it. What, what is your derivation? What, what's the rule sequence? Here, I don't think you can get away with it. You, with this grammar, you could create a different grammar, but with this grammar, uh, create strings from left to right. You only have only one way to produce an A, only one way to produce a B, only one way to produce a BB. Therefore, that would be the only derivation for that particular grammar. Okay. I keep saying there's other grammars though, right? Uh, there's an infinite number of grammars. Let me show you a slightly different grammar. Uh-oh, I'm just gonna type out lambda because See what I'm doing there? I go ahead and I tack the, B, the BB on at the end, and then I say A can either create an A, create a B, or create nothing, which was how you would stop the, the derivation. All right. So that's one way we could change it. We can make the strings from back to front other things. You could just have everything deal with uh, you don't need an A at all. I don't like that. That's a style issue. It's not a correctness issue. I like to have S be the start symbol and you never see it again legal to do what I just did. I 
think it creates the same strings. Uh, professor, yeah. if you would you, you were to use a lambda like you did in the previous example, um, where how would you use that rule into uh, to der in the deriva derivation? Oh, okay. Let me put it back in. There we go. I would use let's let's create string BB using this parameter. Okay. I would use rule one to turn S into ABB. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can. Okay, so I start with S. I can't tell what's showing up or not. There we go. I start with S and then I use rule one and I get ABB. And then I use the lambda rule to get rid of the A. Okay. Nothing, right? Right. Okay. And if we wanted to get the other string, what was it? A, B, A, B, B, B. I would start with S. I would use rule uh, one. Now I've got the end of the string, and I just need to create the front. So then it would become uh, A, whoops, A, A, B, B, A, B, A, B, B. I'm using rule one. Rule, what rule am I using to get the two? Rule three. And we would continue until I had, until I had um, A, B, A, B, B, B with it, but it's gonna have an A stuck in there if I keep going. And then I would use the Lambda rule, rule four to get rid of it. So the lambda rule, you can use it anywhere on the string. As long as I have a capital A. Right, right, right. right? And it, what it does is it says, hey, take that capital A and replace it with nothing. Okay. Replace it with the empty string. Now, again, you have to have that in your grammar. Right. As a rule, um, and we'll, you know, as we start talking more about different grammars, you'll find that Relying on Lambda too much might cause some confusion and or trouble. And uh, when we talk about compilation, we'll talk about why that is a, can be a bad thing. But it's a useful trick. Okay, I need to get this back to where it was. Oh. That was it, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay. I have a question real quick. Sure. So as for this type of question, as long as the grammar that we have written works with both derivations for BB or for the ABABB one. Yeah. So if it works for both, then it would be a correct solution, even if there's only one derivation for both of them. Yes and no. So if you provide a grammar that does the derivations that are called for, then mm -hmm. it's correct for those derivations. But if your grammar, but if, the, if whoever's grading this, <coughs> Michael Fernito, uh, whoever's grading this can think of other strings that are in the language that your grammar will not create, then it's still not technically a, a correct grammar. Right, so th this language is much bigger than those two strings. Mm -hmm. well, what if you create it, for example, I'm going to have another rule. A goes to BBB. If I include that rule, is this grammar correct based on the language that I want? Yes. Still works. Is so. the, oh, wait, it does. <laughs> yeah. How about now? <laughs> Okay, now it does not. Now it doesn't, right. So that language, that grammar does still derive the two strings that we talked about, but it also derives a bad string, a string, a string that's not in the language. Mm -hmm. And, okay. right, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So you can still have a technically incorrect grammar and still get the derivations right for the strings that are asked for. Um, and the way that gets scored is those are separate questions, right? Hey, produce a grammar is question one and give me the derivation is question two. And you get full credit for question two, of course, because you did it. Mm -hmm. 
and one, there'd be a couple points off for, you know, okay, yeah, you did, you did, you did the language, but maybe you missed some strings that are in the language, or you accidentally added strings that are not in the language. The grammar has to la match the language perfectly. Every string in the language has to be derivable by the grammar, and strings that are not in the language cannot be derivable by the grammar. Makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now these grammars with these these uh, BNF rules. We, we group them according to something called the Chomsky hierarchy. And this is named after Noam Chomsky. Um, this isn't one of those, hey, if you're the first to do it, you get your name attached to it, things, even if it's a fairly stupid thing. Um, like a clean star, you know, we'll talk about that in the next lecture. Um, this is a real, gosh, this guy's smart kind of, kind of uh, grouping. He's actually a linguist and computer scientists like the way he did this and it turned out to be perfectly useful for computer science. So it ends up being one of these foundational notions of computer science. He's still alive. Um, he's still doing amazing stuff. Um, it, it basically is going to get into uh, notions of computability, language theory, compilation, compiler optimization, that kind of stuff, even data, even things like data structures like stacks, we'll see stacks and queues uh, tie directly to the language hierarchy. And what he said was, you can group all languages, and he was thinking of languages as sets of strings, by the way, um, into these four different groups. And they're basically the we're going to frame it this way as grouping them as restrictions on the grammar. What we'll find when we do um, models of computation in the next couple modules is you can reframe this exact same hierarchy with models of computation. And the name of the names of the languages are regular, context free, context sensitive and unrestricted. And look at the look at the characteristics of the grammar. The regular must be, okay, the left-hand side contains exactly one non-terminal, and the number of terminals on the right-hand side cannot decrease, and the strings are derived from left to right or right to left. So if we look at this grammar, and we look at these three rules, do we have exactly one non-terminal on the left-hand side of every single rule? I'm going to say yes for you. If you're not sure what I'm asking, please, this is the exact right time to speak up. Just one more time, what exactly is uh, a terminal versus non-terminal, just going back to the differences? Right, so the, the terminals are members of the alphabet. Non-terminals are intermediary symbols that we use to develop the strings, but they're not gonna show up in the final string. They are not. Yeah, so the, the terminals are all the uppercase letters, right? <laughs> The non-terminals are the uppercase level. Oh, non-terminal are uppercase and the right. terminal are lowercase. Right, because here's my alphabet, right? There's my alphabet. And the terminals are the symbols of the alphabet. In other words, when I termin in my terminal string, when I'm done creating the string, notice how it only contains symbols in the alphabet. It does not contain any of the, the extra symbols that I threw in the grammar. Okay. Would we then consider S to be uh the only non uh, or the only terminal on the left hand side s is a is s in the alphabet no so then there's none, none on the left hand there side. you go s is a non terminal and a is a non terminal that's correct so question number 1 does this grammar have exactly one non terminal for every rule on the left hand side sorry Yes. Yes. Question yes. two. Well, yeah. Someone else. Hey, Garter. Hey. Are you in Iceland or U.S.? I'm here. Okay. In Iceland or U.S.? <laughs> oh yeah, here in uh, here in, US. in the U.S. We got training, so at the show okay. up to practice. Okay. 
All right, so we fit rule number one. We have exactly- Mr. I have a quick question. Sure, sure, sure. So if the letters in the alphabet are the terminal uh, letters or you know symbols or whatever, Right. Um, so can you never have a rule that says like little a can also be, so like the right hand side is always like the capital letters? Or the, sorry, yeah, the left hand side is always the capital we're, letters? We're, we're gonna get there. Yeah. Okay. So what you're doing is, see this unrestricted, no restrictions? Yeah. Ah, uh, no restrictions means no restrictions. Uh, Oh, okay. Now that still, you still can only get away with making strings that um, contain only when you once you're done. Once you're done, the string can only contain um, symbols in the alphabet, and the reason is that's the literal definition of a string, right? A sequence composed of members from some alphabet. Okay, so then okay. At, at that point, like in the one that we just oh, did, let's not do that yet. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and ask the question, okay. but the answer is about three weeks away. Okay. Okay, but what's the question? So my question, so in the, in the example that we've been working through, all strings have to end in BB, but if there's no restrictions, like... Well, the strings still have to end in with, with terminals because that's the way the rule goes, but there's no restrictions on how you create it. There's no restrictions okay. on how you get there. Okay. Okay, whereas with regular, there's, there's severe restrictions. Left-hand side can contain only exactly one non-terminal, Number of terminals on the right hand side cannot decrease, and strings are and, and strings are derived from right to left or right to le uh, le right to left or left to right. All right, thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so the first thing: Do all rules have a non-terminal only one exactly one non-terminal on the left hand side? And by that, I mean exactly uh. one terminal and nothing else. Pardon? We're, we're yes on that one, right? Yes. On the right-hand side, do the number of terminals never decrease? In other words, once you get a terminal, you can never get rid of it. Once you get an A or a B, can you ever make it go away in this grammar? No. Okay, a lowercase a, lowercase b. No. So we've met the first two rules that left-hand side has exactly one non-terminal. Right-hand side, never the, the number of the terminals never decrease. I should reframe that rule. I should say not only can they not decrease, let me think about that. I don't have to think about that. Can they be swapped out though? Could I change an A for a B? I'll need to think about that in terms of grammar definition. In this case, no. Um, and then the third rule is for regular that strings are created either from left to right, completely left to right, or completely right to left. How about this one? That's a yes, right? That's a yes on this particular grammar. That's correct. That's a yes on this particular grammar. So is this grammar regular? Yeah. Yeah, because the grant since the since the since you can create a regular grammar for the language, the language itself is regular. Now let's go back to the hierarchy. Now you'll notice as we go from type three down to zero, by the way, I never remember the sequence of types. I only remember regular, context-free, context-sensitive, unrestricted. As you go down this, you get less and less restrictions on the rules that the grammar can have. So the first thing, when we go from regular to context-free, we're gonna take away that rule that strings have to be derived from right to left or left to right. And we'll see why that's important as we start to go through the um, models of computation. And then when we go to context sensitive, we're going to restrict the rules again and or, you know, reduce the restrictions again. So instead of having the left hand side must contain exactly one non terminal, you can have a bunch of stuff on the left hand side. You can have terminals and non terminals on the left hand side. So what that means is instead of matching a simple pattern here, What's the pattern I'm matching? If my string literally has the letter, capital letter A in it, I can replace it with that. That's a pretty simple pattern. But what if my cap, what if my sequence was, uh, it has to have an A before and a B after it. That's a bigger, more complex pattern, but it's putting less restrictions on the grammar because I can make more complex rules. 
and I can make more rules. So in, instead of just, man, whenever I see an A, no matter what, I can replace it, it's going to be, oh, wait, I can only replace that A if, it pre if it's preceded by an A or something. You intuitively, I intuitively always thought that would make the language more restrictive, but we'll show that it actually makes it less restrictive and um, uh, more computational questions can be asked of that language. By the way, that's where context sensitive comes from. The surrounding stuff is the context. And then finally, unrestricted is no restrictions. After we finish this, um, first module about just languages and grammars, we'll talk about what does this mean? How does this get, you know, who cares, right? Uh, but the short answer to that is this. If you've ever heard of a finite state machine, which is a very simple model of computation, you're dealing with regular languages and finite state machines work only with regular languages. If you've heard of a stack, the data structure stack, or a stack machine or uh, push down automata, which is the computational model for stacks, you're dealing with a context-free language. If you're dealing with unrestricted memory like RAM, you're dealing with a context-sensitive language. If you're dealing with unrestricted memory like RAM and you literally have an infinite amount of memory, you have an unrestricted language. And what that turns into is this. All real world computers and programming languages will, will sh show uh, end up here. Java is a context free language. Java has a grammar, it's a context free language. And you can go online and Google Java, Java Bacchusnauer form grammar, and you'll find it. And so does C, and so does Python, and so does Racket, and so does on and on and on. All programming languages are defined in terms of their bacchus nauer form grammars, and they're all context-free. You don't need this stuff. This, this um, you've all heard of Turing machines, right? That's hard to not be in um, this level of a computer class and at least not have heard the term Turing machine. This gets us to Turing machines and Turing machines. So that's where this is all going to come into play later in the course. I'm just giving you the, uh, you know, no surprise endings here. That's where we're going to end up. From real world operations, finite state machines are often used in real world modeling of systems. Context-free languages are literally always used when you're programming. When you're programming, you don't worry too much about these guys, but that's where the Turing machine comes in, which defines the limits of computation and provides at least one model of underlying computation. Kind of the like bridge more into real world. When you're talking about like all programming languages are a type two, uh, like on the Chomsky hierarchy, are you kind of more talking about how they're uh, like executed after compilation? Like, is that more nope. or less? I'm, no? I'm talking literally about the grammars that are supplied to you when you were told, here's how you program in Java or here's how you whatever, whatever. You know. So this is more what the I compiler have sees with. Exactly. And, then, and that's how compilers are built. I'll be right back. I've got a dog that's telling me they got to go out. Okay. So sorry. Okay. Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, the, 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 the compilers literally use the rules that are in bacchus form and use those to, pre to, to answer the question, hey, did Caleb just write a legal Java sentence or a legal Java program or whatever language you're working in? So I know that there's a lot of things like uh, like preprocessor statements that the compiler can like for an example for Java, if you do like a hash include, uh, that's kind of a like direct copy paste to the compiler. Is that s the same kind? I, I'm trying to draw a comparison in my head. right? Yeah, now. we'll get there. We'll get Failing there. Miserably. All right. Yeah. All right. A lot of pre-work, like this thing called lexing. Uh, lexing is basically determining the role that, you know, you're typing a bunch of stuff, right? And, um, you know, it would be, it would be 
how many how many unique variables can we, I, I need to let you guys go in a second by the way a, a minute ago I need to let you go um, how many unique variable names can you come up with an infinite number well that's an awful lot of grammar rules to include in a language so instead you have simpler grammar rules like variable equal sign expression that's a simpler grammar rule so the first thing that happens in part of compilation it scans your program and does what's called lexing it says oh that's a variable that's an equal sign that's an expression and then it can parse to the rule, oh, variable equals expression. Yeah, that's in the grammar. You're good to go. So we'll talk about the different phases of compilation. Um, you will almost certainly never build a compiler in your life because we have software that does that, but it's really good to know what the machine is doing to your program because it is taking your programming and ripping it up into little tiny bits and then putting it back together again. And if you understand how that's happening, sometimes you can get better efficiencies out of your programs. Okay, I'm over time, guys. I've got to let you go. Please. Dr. Garfield. Yeah, yeah. Be confused. Ask questions on the discussion page and we'll pick it up. Okay? Sounds good. All right. Thank you, Dr. Garfield. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Yep. Oh, don't do this.